lecture sponsored by Searles, the School of Information Resources and Library Science, with major underwriting by uh, ISI, Institute for Scientific Information, which is now, I think, called Thompson Scientific. Uh, this is our first Lazarow lecture. We hope it will be the first of many. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Dan Fallis, for, who is the chair of our research series. We see a lot of you at our research series. But for organizing the Lazarow lecture. Thank you, Dan. We are very privileged to have as our first Lazarow lecture Luciana Floridi from Oxford. And I'll let Don finish the introduction. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, on behalf of Searles and the uh, research group for the history and philosophy of information access, I'd like to welcome you to the Lazarow Lecture. And I'm here to introduce you to uh, Luciano Floridi. Uh, Luciano is a member of the philosophy faculty at Oxford University, and he's also a member of the Oxford University Computer Laboratory. And he is the director of the Oxford University Research Group on the Philosophy of Information. Now, Luciano has done important work in several areas of philosophy, uh, but most of his recent work has to do with issues involving information. Uh, philosophers have addressed questions about uh, the flow of information for, uh, for quite a long time. For example, Plato talked about uh, whether or not we should, government should censor the, Homer and the rest of the poets, and John Stuart Mill has famously discussed whether or not we should all be free to express our ideas. But it's only very recently that uh, the many questions about information that philosophers address have been categorized under the title of philosophy of information. And Luciano is basically in charge of the philosophy of information. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles and several books on information and information ethics. He is the editor of the Blackwell Guide to the Philosophy of Computing and Information. And since according to Luciano's own theory, everything is essentially information, you can see that being in charge of the philosophy of information is sort of a rather important position. <laughs> now, you can read much more about Luciano by checking out the Wikipedia entry on it. <laughs> um, but uh, since I've not finished verifying the accuracy of all that information, I'll, I'll just stop here. Um, so without further ado, here is Professor Luciano Floridi, and he will speak to us about relevant information how philosophy can help you find the information that you really need. <laughs> well, obviously, after this presentation, you can only be disappointed. <laughs> Not a chance of uh, living up to uh, what uh, Don has uh, said. Um, I'd love to start with uh, thanking everybody who has uh, sort of maneuvered this, uh, the organization behind my presence here. But I will not do that. I will do that with the last slide. And I'd like to leave that slide there for everyone to enjoy. So no thanks yet. As you know, in, as in every good movie, the thanks will come at the end of the presentation. Instead, uh, just a word about uh, well, the uh, present context, what happened yesterday and what will happen tomorrow. Now, as <laughs> Don has nicely put it, um, well, if if everything is information and you're in charge of information, that, that sounds something like, well, you kind of got. So. <laughs> so. And uh, well, no, I've been accused of being ambitious, so <laughs> that might be no, a little bit uh, over the top. The truth is that yesterday we had a lovely, uh, fantastic meeting with the uh, Center for Consciousness Studies uh, about uh, consciousness and information. That was organized in view of this particular lecture. Uh, which actually, around which everything is uh, uh, moving. Um, today we're going to talk more in terms of uh, theory of knowledge, so-called epistemology, and information with the particular topic of relevant information, what it is and how you can, in fact, even quantify relevant information. And tomorrow there will be more about uh, uh, information within a context of ontology. In other words, the theory of the nature of the uh, universe, of reality. So these three lectures uh, came out as, as a fantastic invitation f for someone who is used to uh, British weather. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, fundamental uh, in this uh, uh, invitation to realize that I was finally visiting uh, one of the uh, few spots that could definitely be called heaven on earth. So I hope that um, uh, 
I'm not sure whether you will enjoy the, the conference, but I'm, I'm sure you are enjoying uh, the, the weather here. And uh, uh, that's what I've been doing yesterday morning and this morning, and I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity too. Now, um, about the uh, conference, let's see if I can use this uh, remotely. Uh, perhaps uh, that should do. Does it work remotely? Yes. OK, so um, the idea is this. Um, I'd like to uh, walk with you through the presentation. Uh, I've tried to make it uh, non-philosophical, not because that would be sort of uh, out of place, but because I know that sometimes when I get presentations from people from different fields, there's a kind of jargon and concept that I don't get it. Uh, so likewise, I would not like to make the same mistake. So I will try to uh, be as uh, clear as possible, and hopefully there will be uh, room for discussion later. Now, um, generally speaking, uh, I will start with a uh, sort of framing uh, the problem, so one, when is information relevant, uh, will provide some uh, background, and then uh, move uh, to an initial answer to that particular question. The initial answer will be in terms of uh, the so-called uh, basic case, uh, maybe that's remote enough uh, for you to be able to see. Uh, the basic case, in other words, the basic answer to that particular question will require some uh, refinements. The refinement uh, the first refinement will be in terms of probability, but nothing to be scared about. In other words, it's going to be just a very simple uh, pinch of probability theory uh, put in our understanding of what it means for some information to be relevant. That, unfortunately, would not be enough. So we shall go through a second refinement to the answer to the question, what is or when is information relevant, introducing a so-called counterfactual. The counterfactual, again, is very simple. I will explain it in the proper slide. At the moment, you just need that bit of anticipation. Well, that is not good enough either. Uh, so there will be a third refinement. Uh, we will need some meta information, which will finally lead us to what I hope is a satisfactory answer to the question, uh, when is information relevant? At that point, we can uh, look at a couple of examples and conclude the introduction uh, of today, of this particular talk. So that's basically the map of the territory, we can start walking. So the first thing to be said is that there are so many different ways of understanding what info, info, information is. And uh, I thought that we had to share some vocabulary here. So basically, uh, the stuff that I'm going to talk about, the information that I'm going to talk about, can be organized in three different dimensions, or meanings, or senses. Um, whenever you hear someone talking about information, that person might mean three different things. It might mean something like fingerprints, uh, information as a piece of reality out there. You cut the trunk of a tree, you look at the rings, uh, and the rings, and you know that that is information. It's out there as a piece of reality, stuff, patterns, for example. Or that person might mean something like an algorithm or a recipe. Uh, in other words something that you need to achieve something else. Again, that's another sense of information, respectable, but it's different from the fingerprints. Or that person might mean what we normally take it to be, you know, something about something else. Uh, information about reality, in other words, with an epistemic or knowledge-oriented value. You get that piece of information about what happened yesterday with the accident in da -da -da, such and such road. So these three, uh, three, three different meanings um, should be kept in mind, but we are going to concentrate on why. Factual information, the trivial sense in which you get information about the train leaving at such and such time. Now, mind that this is uh, not really sort of three different boxes. Oh, no, I pick up some information and it goes in box A, B, or C. No, you actually place your information somewhere here in the field meaning that it could be interpreted as a little bit more about something, a little bit more like a piece of reality. Now, fingerprints could be, for example, information about someone, but it's also information as reality, etc. So, in other words, we want to be a little bit flexible about this organization as long as the distinctions are clear. So, the examples of the third kind could be a train time, a timetable, a map of the underground. Oh, that's a typical London-oriented example. I apologize for that. A physics textbook, a party report, you know, what happened yesterday. Now, 
whatever you have in mind is something about something else. Now it has to have meaning and so forth. So that's the kind of information we're going to talk about. So not as reality, not as a uh, recipe for something. Now, factual information, so we are restricting our field, is something that needs to be understood. And I'm not going to try to convince you that this is the proper way of understanding it. I'm just going to tell you that that's the way I'm going to use factual information. So the way in which I'm talking about factual information, information about something, the timetable, and so on, is that something, an I, a piece of information, is an instance of factual information if and only if it satisfies the following conditions. Well, it's constituted by some data, call them signals, symbols, whatever you like, but it has to have some stuff. That is treated by semiotics, or could be statistics. It doesn't matter. As long as we have, as it were, the material there for our factual information, those data have to have a syntax, they have to have a structure. Somehow they have to be put together in a nice pattern. That is a problem for uh, people working in the syntax uh, department of our uh, information theory. And the syntax has to be joined by some kind of uh, meaningfulness. So the data has to be you know, well formed and they have to have a meaningful. So that's the semantics. Now that's not enough and that's open to discussion, but I will just assume that you also need those meaningful, well-formed data to be truthful. Something that is not true, that doesn't count as information. It counts as content, misinformation, rubbish, something you never want to see, you name it, but is not no, our privileged kind of factual information that we're going to talk about. So, what are data? How data uh, becomes syntactically well-formed? how data acquire their meaning. These are all problems that are being discussed by philosophers. Not only by philosophers, also by philosophers with different ways, methodologies and tools. Um, likewise, how data, which are meaningful and well-formed, become truthful, that's also a big problem for no, philosophers, has been since Plato onwards at least. All this, we're not going to see it, but it's sort of background uh, clarification for us to understand each other. So that's about factual information. Now, one difficulty is, uh, yeah, that was, I thought that was kind of uh, uh, appropriate for this particular uh, issue. Suppose that we understand what factual information is. We have some kind of everyday intuitive understanding that when my mom says, look, no, yesterday it was raining in Rome, that's, that's a piece of information. It was actually raining in Rome. She said it, that it was raining. It's data. They're meaningful. They're well-formed. They're truthful. Well, even that, if that is the case, uh, there's a problem. The problem is this, that all main approaches to information, uh, uh, semantic information, as it's called, actually, whether they are highly mathematical, no, syntactic, or strongly semantic, and you have there some well-recognizable names, well, the problem is that they leave us with a problem. So even if, basically, I'm going to, please, thank you. Suppose that I like some definition of semantic information. There are all those problems we've seen before. What are data? How do they become syntactically, syntactically well-formed? How do they acquire their semantics? How do they possibly become truthful? Suppose we have a solution for all those problems. Even if we have, the next question is, could you please tell me when that piece of information is relevant? Because maybe the best theory in the world will not tell me whether that piece of information makes a difference to me or not. So all these approaches, uh, they uh, leave us with the question that uh, we don't know when that particular information is uh, uh, relevant. And uh, no, just to say it in different words, we would like to know how we can analyze the concept of information that is of interest to the agent, uh, to the person in question, the customer at the bank, uh, your uh, client. So it's quite obvious that the relevance of whatever we're going to call information, it's crucial. It's crucial not only in philosophy where I think I can openly say shouldn't I? Philosophers have been using the concept of information for, well, at least a century with no clue about what they were talking about. That's embarrassing, but it has to be said. 
So not only in philosophy, people have been talking about relevant information for a long time without having any idea about what they were talking, but of course the importance of uh, relevant information, it's trivial uh, to say that in any court, in, at the airport, in a hospital, in a laboratory, in a restaurant, and of course in a library, that's exactly what you want to have. It's useless to be told, oh, look, no, necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as information are such and such and such, unless you're also told when that such and such becomes relevant to the person in question. Um, just to be a little bit more specific, you, know, you go on the web and the whole process of information retrieval, recommendation, syndication, they're all based on the idea of relevance. So um, it would be unfair to say that there has been no theorizing about relevance in any context. That's not true. In fact, actually, the bibliography on relevant information is huge and sort of counting. But the truth is that, so, uh, that there are some available interpretations in different contexts, but actually they're not satisfactory. Um, I shall give some evidence of the lack of actually a satisfactory analysis of relevant information in a moment. But basically, what happens if you check the literature is that people will take the obvious, you know what I mean, kind of attitude. And that, for a philosopher, is not good enough. The philosopher will always start from 2 plus 2 equal 4 and wonder why. We'll go deep down. We'll not look at and therefore, but we'll look like, what do you mean by? So for anyone used to the sort of philosophical investigation of uh, looking at relevant information and thinking, why is that relevant? What, what, what does it make it relevant? Any you know what I mean sort of answer will be unsatisfactory. So, as you can tell, I mean, there are ways in which information uh, may become relevant depending on whether you are playing in the uh, World Cup. Uh, and uh, that's from the uh, London Underground, where not only you get information about where you're going, but also how England is doing. Uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, obviously, people there thought that that was a relevant piece of information that you know, your ordinary customer wanted to have. Now, there are therefore current theories of relevant information that can be consulted. Uh, none of them is uh, very satisfactory, and they can be roughly organized into two families. These are rough distinctions, but they're sufficiently good. One is system-based, and the other one is agent-oriented. The system-based, uh, as you can read there uh, on the slide, they normally usually analyze relevance in terms of topicality, which I'm told is, is a key word in, uh, uh, in the field, or aboutness or matching. Basically, something uh, is relevant depending on how well that something matches a request. And that's especially true in uh, information retrieval uh, literature. Excuse me. There's also various forms of conditional dependence or independence. Uh, so it depends on how much some information can generate some other, some other information. And covariance, so how some information gen uh, is coupled to some other information and how you can possibly uh, identify changes in one on one side by looking at the other side. Um, the covariance and the second half of that uh, sort of system-oriented analysis is especially popular in logic, probability theory, philosophy of science, and so on. And uh, there's a different sort of uh, analysis of relevance, which is more oriented towards the customer, the, the, the guy who's actually going to use uh, the information. I call it their agent-oriented, but any label will do that will tend to analyze relevance in terms of conversational implicature, meaning like, well, what do you really meant by saying that uh, uh, when I ask you that whether Mary was pretty and you, are, you reply that uh, she is very nice? Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's called implicature in philosophy, basically, uh, is when you are a complete bastard, basically. Um, and uh, cognitive pertinence and so on, and it's very popular in, in pragmatics and, and psychology. Now, that has to do with the perceived utility, informativeness, uh, how beneficial that piece of information is to the agent involved. So you can tell that basically the two approaches are this. On the one hand, you find people wondering about just the system and the connections among the systems. So how some piece of information is, roughly speaking, related to some other piece of information. That's the system oriented. On the other side, you find people thinking, what relevance really means, 
has got to do something with the agent, the person involved, and her or his interest. Now, both um, are, have been defined in literature as interest mainly in causal relevance, so relevance as causal connections, or epistemic relevance, relevance in terms of the difference that it makes to me who is actually receiving that piece of information. Now, these current theories, they're not particularly satisfactory. Uh, you find that stated again and again in the literature. I, I will have only one quotation, but you can find many others. System theory, theories that look at how information is related to other bits of information within uh, the context where you're working, they just don't care about what difference that makes to the person involved. So they uh, do not try to define but presuppose the fundamental concept of relevance understood as a relation between some information and the person who is informed. Here is a quotation, but as I said, uh, you may find many others. Uh, from Cristani, uh, 1998, uh, the concept of relevance is arguably the fundamental concept of, of uh, in, in, uh, in information retrieval. We purposely avoid giving a formal definition of relevance. The reason behind our decision is that the notion of relevance has never been defined precisely, although there has been a large number, etc., etc. There has never been agreement about a unique and precise definition. So the conclusion is that a treatment is out uh, the scope of this particular article, and I like to you now call your attention to the last conclusion. Uh, basically, uh, we understand that relevance is a relationship that may or may not hold between a document and a user of the information retrieval system who is searching for some information. If the user wants the document in question, then we say that that relationship holds. Basically, if you care about it, fine. If you don't, that's irrelevant. Now, that's the sort of uh, thing that I was uh, highlighting before. It's a, you know what I mean, sort of understanding of relevance. Unfortunately, for the whole work done in logic, in fact, for some of us who are not logicians, there's a whole logic called relevance logic, um, very formal, very mathematical. All the work done there is based, basically, this is a very influential uh, article by Del Grand and Pelletier in 98. Well, if you look at the conclusion, it's uh, rather disappointing. Uh, as mentioned at the outset, we feel that relevant is a concept for which we have no deep understanding. And things have not improved since. So uh, for the past few years, basically, there has been this idea that, look, it, this is really crucial. This is very important. We have to get it right. But maybe another time. <laughs> Let me go ahead with my business. So I thought, well, maybe this is the time to do some work here on the concept. There are many other reasons why I'm doing this, uh, but I won't bother you with this personal uh, uh, inclinations just to let you know that this is a chapter 17 of a, a book that is forthcoming uh, on the philosophy of information which therefore contains all the connections with relevant information that you may ever want to have. Um, so what is relevant information? And I think that in this particular context would be useful to s move step by step in the uh, sort of refinement of different answers that can be provided to that particular question so that we also know, uh, or each of us knows, where you want to stop and disagree with me. Basically, you say, oh, no, that's enough. Or, yes, I, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm going to go with you for the next step. So the first basic uh, case is that uh, some information, whatever, I, uh, is relevant, and we shall define that as R, trivially enough, for an agent, who will be A, uh, with reference to a particular domain, uh, or context, and that will be D, if and only if, that's a typical definition, well, be ready for disappointment, is no high fly this, uh, if I has been requested by uh, A through a query queue about D, so basically you remember the point before, well, someone has asked for that piece of information, therefore that piece of information is relevant to that someone. Uh, but there's something more, and the Q, A, Q, D there, it's just a sort of synthesis of what we said before. It's, there's nothing mysterious about the formula. So if and only if, one, that piece of information has been requested, and two, that sort of uh, answer, I, satisfies Q as an answer with respect to that particular domain. So again, to put it shortly, uh, I satisfies Q in D, and that's the red formula you find there uh, in, uh, uh, in the slide. Now, this is uh, the most uh, simple uh, answer that can be provided to when 
or what do you mean by relevant information? The uh, scary uh, uh, um, formula there, it, it's just a, a fancy way of saying exactly the same. So if I can, uh, this is just an if and only if, and this is just end. So basically, I is relevant, if and only if, well, your customer has asked for no, that particular item through a query on that particular domain, and that piece of information satisfies that query in that particular domain. Couldn't get any more trivial than that. It's so simple-minded. It's too simple-minded. As a matter of fact, that's what runs behind Amazon or eBay suggestions. Well, if you get an email from Amazon saying, you might be interested in this particular book, that's what is behind. You ask for that, so for similar books, and they think that, therefore, you will need, probably, you'll be interested in the next uh, Harry Potter. Um, in this particular context, it's nice to know that we are in good company. For those of you who are more mathematically minded, there's a whole algebra of information, that's the symbols over there, which formalizes this idea of uh, um, uh, query and answer to the query through what is called as marginalization in information algebra. We will not enter into that, but it's just to know that, therefore, if you need a formalization of all that uh, stuff, it's being done by some mathematicians good for them because it's not good enough for us. Um, there are some advantages uh, uh, in this uh, first step. The, the advantages are quite obvious. First of all, it's domain-oriented. Um, you don't pick up relevance as if it were absolute. Something is relevant within that particular context. It may not be in a different context. That goes without saying, but it's good to have it there as an advantage. If it is okay for Amazon, well, it means that something is good in it anyway. So it's practically you know, doable. Um, it takes into account the agent's interest by referring to the agent's query. Again, that's crucial. There's nothing as relevant information per se. Something is relevant to someone. The someone has to be Mr. Smith, but it has to be uh, an individual. Um, there's not an erotic but erotetic approach. Uh, it will make things much more interesting otherwise. But uh, um, the thing is that it's based on a question and answer that's called erotetic in uh, formal logic, question and answer uh, process. And it's quite objective insofar as uh, that particular item of information must satisfy the question. So it's not that anything goes. That's not true. So you have this balance between a subjective attitude has to be oriented to the interest of the individual. At the same time, it has to be objective because the answer that that individual is going to get has to be a pretty good answer, and we're going to get there. So it's agent-oriented, and that's what I mean by subjective there. There's a whole tradition of subjectivism in probability theory, which will be just touched in the following slides, but it's important to keep it in mind as a way sort of, of background. So subjective there means uh, something that can be compared to the subjective interpretation of probability in probability theory. We don't have to enter into that until the very last slide, and it will be something simple. There are, unfortunately, lots of disadvantages. The first one is that it, there's no account of relevant misinformation, some rubbish that is still quite useful to the agent. The second one, and the third, is that there is no distinction between informativeness, now how much information am I getting, by getting their answer, and the pertinence of that particular item. Something could be awfully uh, pertinent, but very, of very little uh, uh, information with it, and something could be very informative, but in incredibly non-pertinent. So we have to get a little bit of a balance here. Um, there's no distinction of degrees of relevance. At this, at this stage, something is either relevant or fails to be relevant, is either yes or no. But you would like to be able to say, well, no, no, that answer was relevant, but something else was even more relevant. And that cannot be done at the moment, and therefore there is no degree of epistemic utility to the person who is receiving that particular item. There's no explanation of what happens when the second condition, Q, uh, is not satisfied. What happens if the guy didn't ask the question? And that item is still relevant to that question. Now, I'm going to introduce a little mental uh, sort of uh, experience so that we can keep it throughout the rest of the talk. Despite all your knowledge about your family, you do have an uncle in Italy. <laughs> that uncle in Italy is incredibly rich and has left all his uh, money, the castle in Sicily, everything, to you. 
Now, are you going to ask anything about their ankle? Of course not. You don't know about their ankle. But is that relevant? Is it relevant for you that that person has left all his belongings to you? Of course it is. So there's zero, zero chances there you're going to ask Q because, of course, you don't know about Uncle Giovanni. But Uncle Giovanni has left everything to you, and that will be very relevant to know that you, know, you are a rich person now. So that's something that it's problematic and has to be taken care of. There's no explanation of how to treat the relation between the information on the one hand and the question you know, that has been asked. So how adequate the answer to that particular question is. It could be very loose, very vague. Now, is the flight late? Oh, yes, it's very late. 